Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today our topic is, what are the reasons and natural remedies for low stomach acid? Well, we've got to unpack this a little bit because our understanding of low stomach acid in the United States is pretty poor. The stomach, first of all, is in the upper left side. This is my left hand if your image gets reversed sometimes on the internet, things get reversed. I'm wearing my watch on my left hand and the left side of your, of your abdomen is your stomach on the upper side. So if you were to find the nipple line and drop below it to your ribs, there's usually an air bubble just to the left of the nipple line and on the left side and that's called the mega Bloss. The Megan Bloss is the name of a golf ball sized air bubble that's supposed to be there at all times. And so if you were to percuss that and put your finger over it when you're seated upright, you, you would hear that little air bubble. And if you're lying on your back, you would really hear, hear it when the doctor examines you and percusses your trunk and abdomen. So that's where your stomach is. And when you get things like gastritis or stomach problems, that's where the symptom appears. The stomach is not down here. The stomach is right up here. The problem with this low stomach acid usually creates something that is confusing for people to understand because of our modern approach to it. Our modern approach is very kind of faulty. It's really utilitarian, it kind of bashes the physiology system because what we do for low stomach acid is we inhibit stomach acid. And so everyone starts to think, well, because humans think naturally, they think, well, gosh, the root cause of reflux and heartburn and GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, is beaten by an antacid, so therefore I must have too much stomach acid. No, no. All the textbooks, all the literature says that all of these conditions are caused by low stomach acid, not high stomach acid. So your next question as an intelligent person might be, well, then why are they stopping the stomach acid? Let's go through this. With reflux, you have food going down your tube into your stomach and your stomach has got that food and it's supposed to be digested with stomach acid and fluid, liquid water. So this water mess of food, this bolus of food is full of liquid and solid mixed together. And as you start to digest it, if you don't have enough stomach acid, you're going to produce gas. Gases like carbon dioxide and other types of things, but mostly carbon dioxide. As that carbon dioxide is produced, it may be heavier than air when it's out in air, but when it's in your stomach mixed with water, it's gonna rise because it's a gas. So it will still rise and it will press on the valve, which is at the top of your stomach called the cardiac sphincter. And it's called cardiac because it's near the heart. And so it's gonna, it's gonna go up to that sphincter and it's going to push on it and it's going to make it open. And as it opens, Opens, it will start to allow leakage of stomach acid, which is insufficient in the first place, to go up into the esophagus and burn the esophagus. And so now we get heartburn, we get GERD, we get reflux, we get all these feelings, and we take an antacid. And the antacid may be an aluminum containing antacid or a calcium containing antacid, or we might take a proton pump inhibitor drug to stop the production of stomach acid, all because we don't have enough stomach acid. So we're getting maldigestion, indigestion, and if this happens over time, Time and continues to continues to push up and bother us, we're going to get a burn basically at the bottom of our esophagus called Barrett's esophagus or Barrett's esophagitis. And that's a chronic condition where there's some real damage to the cells. This is a precancerous condition where you can get precancerous cells above the stomach, lower portion of the esophagus from this chronic problem. It can be confused for a number of things for ulcers and ulcers happen in the stomach, but most of them happen in the duodenum, which is about 12 fingers of intestine. So when you measure the first 12 fingers, if you were to lay 12 12 fingers along their side, the duodenum is about that long. And so that is the first part of the small intestine that leaves the stomach. And that area is where about 90% of ulcers are formed. So you could have an ulcer in your stomach, an ulcer in your small intestine, in your duodenum, and that can give you a burning feeling in your stomach. Some really good ways to test for that, mostly the breath test for H. pylori. Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria that grows in the stomach and intestines and really blossoms into large amounts. And you can take a breath test for that by breathing into a bag and testing to see if there's a whole balloon of lots of H. pylori, and that tells you you've got an ulcer, and that tells you that you should beat the ulcer and not take an antacid, generally. These are general rules of thought. Another thing that can confuse a person is gastroparesis. Sometimes the stomach acts like it's paralyzed, and it doesn't churn, and it doesn't do its job, and it doesn't secrete. And very often, that's caused by diabetes, medications, and food intolerances. So it's not idiopathic, it means we don't know the cause. It's really caused by those three things if you look it up. It's diabetes, 
drugs, and food intolerances. So we've got to fix our food. We've got to change our food. We've got to do an elimination diet and figure out why we have this gastroparesis. The food pyramid is wrong, folks. It's just wrong. It's often confused with insufficient bile. Sometimes your problem is not stomach acid. It's, it's insufficient bile. That's another lecture and that's another video and we'll talk about that. This is often confused with food intolerances, as I mentioned earlier. And another thing that happens is omega-6s can cause real indigestion. If you tend to eat a lot of omega-6 seed oils and light vegetable oils with your food, like in a lot of Asian cooking, if you go to an Asian restaurant, a lot of times you're going to get sunflower, safflower, sesame oil, cheap rice bran oil, you're going to get cheap peanut oil, and many of these oils are going to give you a real indigestion because of the high omega-6 content, also the oxidation effect because these oils have gone rancid in many cases. And then lastly, something you may not be aware of is that head injury, mild traumatic brain injury, whiplash, and spinal cord shock syndrome from car accidents and falls can sometimes shock your brain and spinal cord such that you can't really control with the descending inhibition, you can't control your stomach acid. And so you end up just over secreting all kinds of stuff. Or more likely, you, you don't over secrete stomach acid, you under secrete stomach acid. Acid production is made by the parietal cells in the lining of your stomach and they require zinc. These cells have enzymes called carbonic anhydrase that are the enzymes that pull hydrogen and chloride ions from your blood, put them together and make hydrochloric acid. Now this acid is very strong. Humans have a really robust pH of their stomach it's below 2.0, which is quite strong, and it, it'll corrode metal. It's very, very strong, and it's protected by layers of mucus. And so we want to make sure that we have good stomach mobility and good stomach secretions, and we want to make sure that we have enough zinc to make that enzyme cofactor for carbonic anhydrase to make the hydrochloric acid. If you don't have enough zinc, you can't make enough hydrochloric acid. And the problem is, if you've got a zinc deficiency that's chronic, you need stomach acid to absorb zinc. So sometimes you may have to take a zinc lozenge, which means taking something that would be dissolved in your mouth like a cough drop made of zinc. There are lots of those out there. I tend to like the ones that are better tasting. There's lots of different tastes. There's lots of different dosages. Typically an adult needs about 25 milligrams a day of zinc to be healthy in their life. You should know that eating carbs produces indigestion and that low stomach acid is a byproduct and CO2 will be released. So why would we want to block acid if low stomach acid is the problem? Well, if we want to shut up a patient and get their symptom to go away, we don't fix the root problem and we give them an antacid or a proton pump inhibitor. And that doesn't sound like fixing the root cause to me. I'm less interested in that. If I really love my family and I don't want them to be sick, I want to fix the root cause. I think you would too. Aluminum is in some antacids. It is the highest source of aluminum in oral consumption. Typically, there are other consumption of aluminum that comes from intake of aluminum that comes from injections. Problems with PPI blockers are another story. There's a whole nother video to talk about with proton pump inhibitors, which are stomach acid blockers. These are drugs that actually block the process of making stomach acid, and they have all kinds of detrimental problems. So stomach acid is really important to have in our bodies. We don't have stomach acid in our stomach when we don't have food in our stomach. When our stomach is empty, it goes back to neutral pH of about seven and the pH of water, it's perfectly fine and we don't have stomach acid. Then when we eat food, especially protein, we get more stomach acid secreted and lots of mucus that protects us and that's good to help us protect ourselves from our own stomach acid so that we don't digest our own stomach and burn a hole through our own abdomen and through through the floor, which some people worry about. The stomach acid is needed for protein digestion. You really need stomach acid to digest protein and to digest minerals. Zinc is a mineral and minerals need some acid to be absorbed and so that vicious cycle is a real problem. Further, zinc and iron and other minerals are carried, even heavy metals are carried by a, a protein called metallothionine 3. Metallothionine 3 is studied quite heavily in humans and horses and other animals. It can be absent in children, relatively absent or low in children that have chronic anemia problems. And I see a lot of children with learning disabilities that have anemia and iron deficiency partly because they don't have enough metallothionine because they don't have enough zinc and enough protein. So one of the things that we do with these children is we give them extra zinc, we give them extra protein, and over the course of three to six weeks, they tend to make enough of this metallothionine, then they can finally absorb iron, and then they can finally get rid of their anemia. So this is a real chronic problem because lots of children in the United States and around the world get learning disabilities because they're iron deficient anemic. I like to use lozenges. Some people use zinc picolinate, which is taken orally and swallowed, and that's perfectly fine. I also like to use the temporary support of lemon juice or raw apple cider vinegar, which is a good pH. You won't find that other citrus fruits are a good pH. Grapefruit doesn't work, oranges don't work, tangerines, tangelos uh, won't work. Only lemons, limes, and raw apple cider vinegar are acidic enough to truly help the stomach acid. If you want to boost your stomach acid, you can do that, but be careful if you've got an ulcer, that's not going to help you. So get tested. You need protein to induce acid 
acid and you need a multi-trace mineral supplement to make sure you have enough of all the trace minerals to make your stomach work and all your enzymes work. And that's important to make sure that you don't just focus on one mineral. You look at all of the trace minerals. And that is the reasons and natural remedies for low stomach acid.